We just played in a game of D&D &D where there were five players. The two that mean anything here are the Asimar Paladin and the Human Wizard. The two of them were dating. One thing to keep in mind is that the boyfriend made the girlfriend's character for her because she was fairly new to D&D. We suspect that he made her character what his perfect girlfriend would look like. So basically a Greek goddess warrior who's seven feet tall with rippling muscles. Over the course of the campaign, the wizard has wanted to seduce his in real life girlfriend in game for a while. He has stated his character fell in love with her when she saved his life after he yelled at a big bad evil guy thinking he had the power to stop them when in reality, he was seconds away from dying. While getting ready to fight a large beast, the wizard approached the paladin and said that he never had anyone who really loved him, and he thought that with everything going on, he didn't want to waste time. He had written a speech which he had read to her for five actual real-life minutes she sat in silence as she listened to him explain why she should date him and why she is the one for him. At the end of it, she told him she didn't see him like that and walked away. It was incredibly awkward for everyone involved. We all sat around the table exchanging looks and trying not to laugh. Even the DM tried to intervene by having several characters come by them. In an attempt to cut short this awful seduction attempt, the wizard eventually caught on, brushed it off, and we moved forward. I'd say he took rejection like a champ, but writing a college essay on why you'd be great in bed was never going to win you any favors, my dude. A relationship out of game doesn't entitle you to one in game, which funnily enough, we usually see this interaction played in the inverse especially here on this channel. Stop me if you've heard me before, regale you with a story about a player who thought that because their characters were in a relationship, that that meant they're now dating in real life. So whether it's the player, or in this case the player's character, you're not getting any closer to having a muscle mommy Asamar break your spine over her knee, god I wish that was me, without getting their consent about it first. And so, like the start of any good relationship, it's best to start with a good first impression. On that note, my name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch. We're in between stealing snacks, resting on the windowsill of a nearby marriage counselor, I gather alongside my murder of crows to share stories of tabletop tragedy. And so, without further ado, let's gather up a murder and dive into this next story. So this happened about three years ago, but I think back to it sometimes. We all met over a virtual chat room when the topic of Dungeons and Dragons came up, and the conversation got very enthusiastic. The host of said chat room mentioned wanting to run a D&D one-shot, and asked us if anyone would be interested. Most of us were eager to get in the game, and we all accepted her invite to a pre-existing gaming discord. Nothing big, it was pretty small. About 20 people. There was of course the general chat, a place to drop memes and shit posts and a place for gaming and sharing gaming clips. She invited us to a Roll20 game, which appeared to be a quick dungeon crawl through a hedge maze-like labyrinth. We were making our characters up while happily talking about our characters over video chat, everyone with their cameras on except for the DM. Then as we were about to start, the DM turns on her camera and it was revealed, not the face of a person, but a very cool VTuber avatar. It was quite the cool surprise, but by everyone's reactions, it wasn't taken very well. I knew little at the time about VTubers to know if she was a popular streamer or not, but we all had the same thought process and almost immediately turned off all our cameras. I can't speak for the other players here, but everyone sounded pretty uncomfortable or confused, and I remember the whole game feeling awkward as hell as we carried on like nothing happened while the DM's avatar carried on in the bottom left corner. It was never mentioned prior if she was going to stream or record and share the game anywhere, even though she streamed it live in her Discord group. There were no links to her Twitch or a YouTube channel, so there was no way of knowing prior about it, and we just kind of immediately jumped into the game without really knowing what we got ourselves into. Now I've played some one-shots up to this point, and I'm aware of how bad they can be sometimes, but the ones I've played up to this point were alright. 
they were always either ended in a cliffhanger with the possibility of a session two, met a satisfying conclusion, or some problem would come up which kept us from finishing. But this DM did none of that, and instead ended the game with an unwinnable fight. We TPK against her home-brewed plant-like hedge knights, keeping to the theme of it being a hedge maze, as all the enemies had some sort of tie to the labyrinth itself. She ends the session by saying that this was just a playtest for a much bigger game she was going to run, and reset our tokens back at the start before kicking us out and closing the game. The game she mentioned? Well, it never happened. I'm not upset about it, but I thought it was strange, and it left a sour taste in my mouth. We were never told it was a playtest or really anything about the game before we jumped in. Though, the fool I am sometimes stuck around for more. I'd never get to play with those players again, though. In the next one-shot, my second game with Host, it was just me for a while, with the DM's DMPC, a cutout token of a generic glaive-wielding anime girl that looked like Asuna from Sword Art Online. I know DMPCs have a bit of infamy, but this one was one that was alright. The DMPC didn't try to control the narrative, and since it was just us for a while, it was a welcome addition having an additional combatant. My character was a dragonborn rogue with a soldier background, hired as a mercenary by the town to clear out the local graveyard. It was meant to be quick and simple. Get in, kill a few undead, find the source of necromancy, and destroy it. Along the way, we had another player join us halfway throughout the game. He came off as a problem player at first. Not to be mean, but he had the exact nerdy accent we all make when we make fun of these horror stories. He referred to the DMPC as my goddess, which seemed to make us both uncomfortable at first, and it really just came out of nowhere. I think maybe it was some sort of connection from another game they played together. He'd also try to tank for the lady getting in her way sometimes, which left me open to taking a lot of damage, and I went down a few times. He also tried to eat everything he killed, catching bats with his spiked club and eating them like it was cotton candy made me think of a barbaric snapping turtle. He wasn't actually that bad of a guy, though. After a while, we ended up developing a sort of quiet respect for each other as capable fighters, and he gave the DMPC some space, doing a lot of the tanking, while the DMPC would back him up as my squishy rogue resorted to shooting arrows from far away. But despite that, the zombies had a way of targeting my character anyways, and I still kept finding myself making death saves. Maybe I just suck as a rogue. There was nothing outside of groups of zombies and bats, though, unlike the last game. But the zombies didn't stay dead for too long. Every once in a while, one would come back to life, which became a problem as they gradually increased in number. Eventually, we cleared the whole graveyard and found nothing that led us to some sort of source, save for the well and the mausoleum. We decided first to investigate the well, since we both thought a well in a graveyard was a little odd. As we reached the bottom, we ourselves in a narrow tunnel with walls made of skulls and such, but just more zombies and bats down here too. We climbed back out after clearing the tunnel and decided to check out the mausoleum. Nothing there either. Pretty small and nothing stood out. We concluded that it was a safe enough place to take a long rest, and we sealed the doors behind us after checking the coffin in the center. Probably not the smartest thing to do, but you'll never guess what happens next. Once we got back up, the DMPC was gone. Upon opening the doors, there standing there waiting for us were two bears. Yes, just normal, basic bears. It made no sense at all. But Barbarian Tortle rushed out to fight them, only to go down with one blow. No death saves. He was just dead. Well. I'm dead, said the barbarian turtle player. He sounded so defeated, and I really felt bad for him, but then quickly realized I was about to be the same. Crazy that the bears moved a whole 60 feet and had me cornered in the mausoleum. I tried to fight them, but quickly met a swift end. We both wondered, the flock just happened to us. Another TPK, with the DM apologizing that this game too was just a playtest for a bigger game since none of the other players were able to make it. She reset our tokens back to the beginning, while adding back all the other players' tokens, and said we'll be able to play the real game next time. Again, 
the real game never happened. And like the fool I was, and hungry for a good one-shot, I kept playing all the other one-shots she made, all of them ending the same way, getting less and less comprehensive. There was one that ended up in forced PvP though, where I had to fight the other player that got possessed by a shadow of sorts, till he took a fireball to the face by my tabaxi wizard, which ended up killing him in one shot that killed the one shot too, which she gave the same excuse. Eventually, the server died. Everyone just kinda ghosted the server, but everyone was still in the group. No further updates by the host, even after offering to run some of my own games in an attempt to get some kind of interaction. A few memes and shitposts later, I eventually left. Can't say I had a lot of fun, but it was definitely something. Thought it was strange she kept using the same excuse every time. I kept thinking about it sometimes. Asked myself at one point if I was somehow the problem. Or maybe just nobody liked me. I still can't tell. If she was just someone with a VTuber avatar that was trying to get a start at live streaming some VTT D&D games. Or just thought it would be a cool idea to have one. Still can't find anything about a channel. But thinking back... She never really posted anything, outside a few screenshots and clips of herself, scoring some wins without her avatar. No links to a channel of any sort. Nonetheless, I hope this story has entertained someone out there, or give them an idea of what not to do for a one-shot, nor how to kickstart your D&D stream. TLDR joined a one-shot with a chat room full of people. The host reveals she's a VTuber during the one-shot, which doesn't end well. DM ends it with an intentional total party kill. Get told it was just a playtest for a bigger game. We never get to play that game. Get offered more one-shots that all end the same. Apparently they're all playtests for a bigger game that we'll never get to play. So her server quickly becomes a ghost town. Conclusion. My final closing statement. I do regret leaving the server even though it died. I didn't form any lasting friendships out of it either, but it was a bit more memorable, if not awkward. Maybe I was wrong in hoping that we'd eventually get to play in a longer lasting campaign. Perhaps the DM was just trying to get into the hobby, or testing the idea of eventually streaming a D&D game. I had asked her about it, but never got a response. And to this day, I haven't found any channels. But I hope she's doing well, and I hope that the other players eventually find their campaign. Wish nothing but the best for everyone that shared this experience. It kind of sounds like to me that this DM was pretty new, and based on how the dungeon itself played out, that this could have even been their first experience making one. I don't necessarily think that this DM is like a bad person or anything, but the lack of transparency throughout this whole quote-unquote playtest was baffling to read through. If they really wanted feedback or an understanding of how they could have changed it for the better, this DM really needed to make it clear from the get-go that this dungeon and their experience in running games are both in their nascent stages, and that the group joining in will probably Probably be playing the hedge maze multiple times over, at least until it reaches a state where the whole thing can be explored, and that they feel comfortable enough with running it in a full game. But in my humble opinion, the best thing that you can do is to just make the damn thing with what ideas you have and run it. It's not going to be perfect, but you can learn so much by just doing it. Hell, my first dungeon had like 12 skeletons in the opening room that just immediately jumped the party in a square, featureless room while for some godforsaken reason, I played the dubstep remix of spooky scary skeletons in the background. And despite my best efforts, the party still had a good time. Your first dungeon is going to be filled to the brim with completely unbalanced encounters, bizarre references, baffling trap placements, and puzzles that would make Team Silent blush at the sight of their maddening design. But this is by design. <laughs> See what I did there? You don't know what you're doing, so you just have to be honest about it and just do it, lest you drag yourself, and in this particular story, everyone else with you, in a loop of infinite design, where you're restructuring the same opening hallway over and over again over the course of several weeks, instead of actually finishing your dungeon. Hello, I need some advice, even though a lot of this post will be me complaining. The complaints are context for the question I have. A while back, I joined an online group for a 5e game. I was so excited that when the DM said they needed another player, I recommended a friend to fill out the party. 
Remember this, it will be important later. But things very quickly went downhill, and I'm not sure what to do. Primarily because my laundry list of grievances with games I'm affiliated with and have been in have made me question if I am just unlucky or if I am in fact that guy. The cast. Me playing a paladin. Gray, the DM. Jerry, the DM's boyfriend, who plays a wizard. Bilbo, my in-real-life friend that I invited to the game, plays a warlock. Others. The game had quite a bit of turnover, so other characters may come up. Light spoilers ahead for Shadow of the Dragon Queen. At first, everything looked great. The DM made it clear they were experienced. Further discussion revealed Grey, Jerry, and I even had similar ideologies in terms of party balance. Something other people in the hobby that I would bring it up with call me a stickler for adhering to. However, upon reflection, I question how genuine they were in this mindset. Because as soon as it became clear that over half of the party were going to be damage-dealing spellcasters, and the fourth, a rogue, wasn't a healer, Jerry threw their hands up and joined the blaster caster side of the room. An issue came up almost immediately, as Grey held a vote to decide what module she would run us through. The winner was Dragonlance, Shadow of the Dragon Queen. As much as I love this setting and its approach to a mage's society and the balance between good and evil, I didn't vote for that game because of the very issue the decision caused. As soon as the module was declared, I brought up the fact that the Dragonlance setting of Kryn has a restricted race pool as it is a low fantasy setting, at least compared to the Forgotten Realms or Exandria. Nobody except Jerry and I knew this, and almost everyone who was caught off guard by this bit of information refused to accept it, demanding the right to play more exotic races. This forced poor Grey to homebrew in reasons that races that aren't listed as options in the module could be included in the story, and she worked herself to the bone, covering as many options as possible. Looking back, I don't know if Grey just declined redoing the votes with this new information, a la, you made your bed, now lie in it, or if it just never came up. But unfortunately, looking at the party as I write this, none of the races she put herself through the ringer to allow in the established setting are in the party, probably because the kind of person who throws a tantrum over not getting to play a turtle with a plus 5 AC isn't the kind of person to stick around for the long haul. The game started out fine. We ran through some of the opening missions with no difficulties, but then Grey and Jerry started to play fast and loose with Kryn's world building. For those of you who don't know the story of Dragonlance, is that after the mortals of Kryn committed various atrocities and insulted the gods, they unleashed a cataclysm and abandoned the arrogant mortals to their fate and now, centuries later, they are slowly returning. Unfortunately, the gods of evil are the first to make their presence known, and any good mortals who wish to stand against them will need to show their unwavering faith if they wish to give the gods of good a reason to step in. Grey's response to this lore is to have one of the gods make their presence known and use their powers just to screw with our party's rogue. I'm not sure if there was something going on behind the scenes, or Rogue approved of this little joke or not, and if it had anything to do with the Rogue eventually leaving. I think it was a scheduling issue, but I don't 100% know. But I know I didn't like it, because it betrays the established lore of the pre-generated module, but didn't want to say anything for three reasons. One, I am not confrontational. I was raised to never speak up for what I wanted slash thought, and was constantly told that whenever I had a grievance with a situation, I was the one in the wrong. So I'm not used to speaking up when I see things I don't like slash agree with. 2. It wasn't happening to my character, so I was worried I would look like I was speaking on the rogue's behalf and taking away their voice if I were to say anything, making me the bad guy. And three, I was afraid of looking like an, um, actually, guy, 
or someone who refused to let people have fun, if it wasn't the right way. I.e., the kind of person who's frequently featured as the antagonist of other stories here. Despite that joke, the rogue was not the first to leave. That honor goes to the sorcerer, who did not want to abide by Dragonlance's world building. My favorite thing about Dragonlance is the Tower of High Sorcery, a conglomerate that all arcane magic users must join, or be hunted down as renegades. Sorcerer did not want to join the Tower of High Sorcery, as it wasn't cool enough. For their edgy fallen Asimar, who's also part dragon, to submit to rules like that. This helped give Grey a way to remove them when they decided to leave the game. Unfortunately, the specifics are the setup for another recurring element that doesn't sit quite right with me. As it turns out, Jerry's wizard is centuries old, valid since they're an elf, and had witnessed the cataclysm firsthand, which gave them knowledge that the rest of the party, being shorter lived, wouldn't have access to. Not only that, but they belong to a massive family, with each of their siblings being very powerful, holding a lot of renown and influence throughout the land. These siblings were a deus ex machina to be used by Grey to do random things, like remove the character of the player that left, give the party magic items, spell components, or teleport us long distances. Eventually, after a few story beats, we get to the event that made me lose all love for this adventure, when Grey rewrote my character backstory. Originally, my paladin was part of a group that sought to restore the honor and glory of a knightly order that was disgraced, when it was believed that they were the ones who caused the cataclysm. The idea was that the group weren't official members of the order, as the order had, to my understanding, been disbanded, or at the very least, held none of the authority they once did. As a result, the group my character belonged to were basically a bunch of dreamers with no real standing in the world. Only the ideal that once again, the banner of the order they idolize would fly once again. The day of the session, she messaged me at work and asked if she could make my character the descendant slash distant relative of an NPC. She made it sound like a Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker kind of thing, where this NPC disgraced themselves and brought about ruin. My character could make the right decisions and make up for what happened centuries ago. This is not what Grey had in mind. After having another of Jerry's character's siblings show up and show off their incredible power, the party was teleported to a lavish manor, where Grey announced that my character was not actually from a humble group of wide-eyed idealists, but they were actually nobility. With next to no prompting, she decided that I was the next in line of a wealthy and regal house, and as such, it was my duty to get married to continue the family name. To twist the knife even further, she declared I would have to choose a sibling of one of the other player characters to marry. I had never been more uncomfortable. I have had characters that were singled out to be murdered, characters who were denied the one thing I built them for. I've even had a DM bring a character of mine's father into the game as an NPC to make crass jokes about what the character was like when they were an infant. But none of that compared to being told my character, a character designed to have humble origins that rose against the tide of darkness through sheer devotion, was actually just a rich kid on his year off in Europe. Eventually, Grey realized this was not the move to make and let the party leave to get back to the actual module. But it was too late. I was no longer playing the character I created. If anything, it was worse that he could turn this imposition down with no consequence, because it means that my character's entire identity was rewritten for nothing. I still wonder if I should have just turned in my sheet and said, okay, he fulfills his duty and gets married. As a result, he'll no longer be questing with the group. 
leaving the game since my character wouldn't be able to go save the world, or at least making a new character that won't have that humiliation hanging over their head. Or I guess let Grey make a new character so I don't have to worry about their backstory getting butchered down the line. I didn't give it much thought, because until we were back on the module's path, I was completely disassociated, unable to put into words what I thought about the situation, and just desperate to get out of it. After this plot twist, the campaign somehow got worse. We entered a segment where the party needed to go on a quest to hunt for a villain across a massive, hostile environment, where in our attempts to navigate, we come across places with our own side missions that are supposed to prepare us for what lies ahead, and even establish the scale of the threat we were pursuing. Grey turned it into a slog, where we would go sessions at a time with nothing happening. Just endless random encounters where flying enemies would grab party members, fly them hundreds of feet into the air, and drop them to kill them with fall damage. If it wasn't flying monsters using that tactic, Grey would make us fight golems that reduced max hit points, a move that, at our level, and because our cleric had come and gone due to them losing their cleric powers thanks to a cursed item we weren't able to fix, but luckily, one of Jerry's many sisters could teleport in to fix all of the damage, and then leave. After one of these fights, the DM was disappointed that none of us trying to use a damage type the golems were not only immune to, but would cause them to heal, expressing she really wanted to see that happen in one of these fights. Another upsetting event was when we were sidetracked at a location we needed to go to for bearings, to triangulate where the module's main villain was hiding. After all was said and done, Grey angrily shouted that we did that side quest wrong and that there was something really cool at the location we just left that we missed because of our actions. Which seems like something a GM shouldn't say. We were also forced to constantly backtrack to a camp that was set up to face the threat head on. So that added to the number of random encounters and created more gaps in the story where nothing plot relevant happened. The cherry on top was yet another all-powerful wizard character that the party needed to guide to a place the plot needed them to be. But Grey decided that this elven wizard, despite their immense knowledge and centuries of experience, didn't speak common. So any time any character other than Jerry's wizard spoke to him, Grey would have the wizard turn to Jerry and ask, What did that one say? I know that's nothing compared to rewriting a backstory without permission, but it was extremely annoying to have roleplay and plot-relevant discussion constantly come to a grinding halt for the sake of a running joke. At the camp, there were two major NPCs, one that was a support and head of the army we would use to take on the module's main villain, and a different villain. The players knew he was a villain, because the DM made it more obvious than an episode of Scooby-Doo. But because none of the player characters' insight slash investigation roles were ever high enough, they weren't allowed to think that the assassin for hire that liked poison that was used to kill several NPCs earlier in the module, that would go out on scouting missions with soldiers and then come back alone, was suspicious. Even when Grey went out of her way to tell me to use Zone of Truth on him, to force him to reveal his true self, it didn't work. That session was especially bad, because Grey then messaged me on the side and told me her four-part plan that guaranteed that none of the party would be able to read or expose the villain, something I couldn't share or express in character, because it's meta-knowledge. The worst part is that the villain was able to drive a wedge between the player characters and the army commander. This is because Jerry's wizard is also so beautiful that the commander NPC couldn't help but fall in love with her. And invincible villain NPC told the commander that my paladin was trying to steal her away from him. This deception was exacerbated by the actions of Bilbo's warlock, 
who delighted in seeing my paladin's friendship with him, break to the point where we had to get into a physical fight. The fact that I won was worse, because now the commander could not address Jerry's wizard without my express permission, which only gets grosser and grosser the more I think about it. I really want to leave this game because of these things. My character being changed without my permission. The fact that months of real life time going by without anything happening due to endless random encounters that eat up all of our game time. And the fact that it feels more like DM versus player now than trying to reach the end of this book in one piece. But I feel like I can't leave because I was the one who invited slash recommended Bilbo. But Bilbo was a close friend of mine in real life, so I can't just leave him after hyping up this module slash setting. But I know I can't tell Bilbo to leave or come with me, because he made it clear that he's having a lot of fun, probably because Grey lets him play his warlock as chaotic neutral. With everything you're thinking of when I say chaotic neutral on this server, the warlock is arrogant, abrasive, steals from the party, and does gross stuff like having their familiar messily devour enemies we kill. Much to the disgust of the rest of the party, they also have a special side mission from their patron, Kill My Paladin, which is part of the reason why they jumped on the chance to sever his bond with the army commander NPC. I need to know what the right thing to do is in this situation. Is it right to leave a friend in a game you invited them to? Am I making too much of what's been happening? Or is there something with this DM? I want to talk to the people involved, but I'm not sure what to say or do. Any advice? To user Ally of Justice on the Discord, first, thank you for submitting your story. And second, I want to tell you something that I hope will resonate with anyone else that is in a similar situation. Whether you feel like you can't leave a bad game because you're playing with a good friend, or if you feel like you just sunk too much time in a bad game and you might as well just stick around, let me be the first to tell you it's not going to get any better unless you have a conversation about your grievances. Firstly, I'd advise that you get your party together before your next game session and have a chat. It doesn't have to be framed as anything too serious, something low stakes, where you can air out your concerns and how you've been feeling about these games. Because OP, this isn't nothing. You're clearly incredibly frustrated, and I can tell by what you shared here that you are no longer having fun in this game. And for your second step, once you begin this conversation, you need to tell your party about why you're not having fun. If it helps, consider making a list of the problems you've had with this game, and talk through each of these points and how they made you feel in the game. You might even be surprised that some of your fellow party members may have been having similar issues. Maybe even share them this post if you aren't feeling confident enough to verbalize your feelings about the game. And lastly, and this might be the hardest part, you need to be prepared for the possibility of leaving this game. And if you'd like, you can skip the rest of all this and go straight to leaving the game. And no one should judge you for that. Games are supposed to be about having fun and tabletop role-playing games in particular are at their most fun when everyone at the table is having a good time. If you're not having fun, and if every attempt to try and have fun is snuffed out, then you need to stop playing with this table. Maybe you can get Bilbo into the next game you join or even run, but holding out for them and losing your mind in a horrible game isn't worth it, and you should value your time and your sanity. I realize that all of this could really just be boiled down to something like, uh, no d and is better than bad d and but the reasons why people stick around toxic games are often far more complex than a catchy phrase and deserve a more nuanced response. If you yourself have had a tabletop gaming experience go wrong, please come by the Crow's Perch Discord channel, link in the description down below, and submit your story. Most bad games are just an experience and nerves. But stories like this are ones that really need attention in my eyes, as they can be defining moments as to whether or not someone even continues playing in this hobby that I personally enjoy, and hope that many others will continue to enjoy for decades to come. If you'd like to support the channel, be sure to like this video, leave a comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon and joining the Burb aristocracy, like the Counts of Quills.
like Fairy Fire, Jess Monica, Critical Kunick, Shep Dog, Evix, King Drizel, Christian Pip, Cosmosis, Haley Thompson, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. Or if you'd like to pledge $5 instead, consider joining our Barons of Beaks, like Spoogie, Archangel Nuriko, Kieran Slater, Running Bear, Haley McAuliffe, Brittany Mars, Spectre Spark, Ars Tarak, Ghost Legan, The School Bus, Kuntos Weasel, Cardispawn, Lord Rend, Wormy, Den of the Drake, Mickey Eatley, and Anya. But if you would like to donate $10 a month instead, then consider joining our Dukes of Feathers, like Apocalypso, Repetitive Debug, Xeno Cruise, Angrad, Grunt, Kive Mind, Jarrett Sewer, and Matthew McQueenie. Also, thank you to everyone who's recently signed up as a $1 patron or as a member on YouTube. I don't do shoutouts for you guys, but I really, really do appreciate you as even a dollar helps a lot. But with all of that out of the way, I'll see you next time as the crow flies.